welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today is going to have a bit of a different format from our typical lecture. We're going to go through a reaction recap of the past 30 videos, including this one. But besides that, we're also going to go through the practice problems that we assigned last lecture. Finally, at the end of this lecture, we're going to have six exam questions that we're going to show you this time, and then we're going to solve in the next video. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems I assigned last lecture. So last time we talked about Bayer-Villager oxidation. And so in this case, we have an aryl aldehyde, which is a Benz aldehyde. And when we treat these with MCPBA, we actually get formate esters. However, if we take an aliphatic aldehyde, like this one shown here, because this isn't connected to a benzene ring, a secondary position has less of a migratory aptitude than a proton. So this will actually just oxidize to the corresponding carboxylic acid. So this is another nifty trick to keep in your back pocket if you're having trouble making a carboxylic acid. However, compared to the other methods that we talked about, this occurs via a 1-2 shift. In this final example, we have a methyl ketone on one side and a quaternary position on the other. And because a more substituted position has more of a migratory aptitude than a methyl, we'll form an ester as an oxygen carbon bond on the more substituted part of the molecule. So let's get to today's material. We're gonna recap the last 29 lectures and we're gonna have some exam questions for you guys. So the major concepts from the first seven videos include common functional groups, which we talked about in lectures one, two, and three. If you're not sure what IOC stands for, it just stands for Introduction to Organic Chemistry. In lecture three, we talked about alkene E and Z nomenclature. We talk about ring sub substitution nomenclature in lecture four. In lecture five and six, we discuss the topic of chirality. Finally, in lecture seven, we talk about nucleophilicity, including nucleophilicity and electrophilicity parameters. We discuss nucleophiles and electrophiles, as well as basicity and nucleophilicity, which are important concepts. I've highlighted the colored ones as the most important, but all of these have an important role in organic chemistry. The next set of main concepts are from lecture 8 to 14. So in lecture 8 we talk about leaving groups which can often be displaced or eliminated. In lectures 9, 10, and 12 we talk about substitution reactions, specifically SN2 reactions on nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and phosphorus. We also have a few other ones such as cyanide in there. Uh, additionally we have E2 reactions in lectures 11 and 12. SN1 and E1 is discussed in lecture 13. And the synthesis of esters is discussed in lecture 14. Uh, it's also worth noting that in lecture 14 we talk about the formation of ketals, acetals, and imines, uh, which is an important thing to know about. Now in lectures 15 to 22 we talk about 1-2 additions, which includes the addition of Grignard reagents and organolithiums to carbonyl compounds, as well as aldol condensations, which could be the attack of an enolate at a carbonyl, as well as aldol additions. So this is discussed in lecture 20, 21, and 22 respectively. We then talk about 1-4 additions, which includes carbon nucleophiles as well as other nucleophiles in lectures 17 and 19. We also talk about the enolate and enamine formation from ketones, as well as their reactions in lectures 18, 20, 21, and 22. And the last set of lectures that we have major concepts from include the reduction of carbonyls in lecture 23, the oxidation of alcohols to carbonyls in lectures 24 and 25, the epoxidation of alkenes in lecture 26, the oxidative cleavage of alkenes and alkynes in lecture 27 and 28, and finally the Bayer-Villager oxidation in lecture 29. Now, I thought it would be useful to break down each of these into different reactions, so ways to make esters. So in this first one, we have ways to make esters. So you can do an esterification, which would involve a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. You could do this via a Fischer esterification or an acyl halide, or you could use a coupling reagent. And so these are the two different reactions shown here. If you want to see more about those, you can see that in lecture 14. Additionally, we have the Bayer-Villager oxidation, which produces esters, which is shown here. Uh, if you want to see this, you can look at video 29. Now, if we want to make alcohols, we have several different options. The first would be the ring opening of an epoxide with lithium aluminum hydride, which is shown here. We talk about this in lecture 23. In lecture 28, we talk about the upjohn oxidation or dihydroxylation of alkenes using osmium tetroxide. This is another method to make alcohols. Another option that you have is the SN2 reaction of a silver carboxylate with an alkyl halide followed by the hydrolysis of the ester. So here we can see that an ester is formed and subsequent hydrolysis 
affords uh, this alcohol. Now you could also include this one in the previous slide where we were talking about methods to include or methods to access esters. Another option that you have is the reduction of carbonyls such as esters, ketones, or aldehydes. This will afford you with alcohols as well. So another way that you can make an alcohol is the addition of an organomagnesium or an organolithium compound to a carbonyl. Most of the time we do this with organomagnesiums because organomagnesiums tend to be mostly nucleophilic, but we can also use organolithiums occasionally. Now, if you add this to an aldehyde, you'll get a primary or you'll get a secondary alcohol. If you add this to a ketone, you'll get a tertiary alcohol. And because esters continue reacting, you get tertiary alcohols with symmetrical substitution. Now, if you wanted to make an aldehyde or a ketone or a carboxylic acid, one option to make an aldehyde or a ketone, as we discussed in lecture 24, was the oxidation of a primary alcohol. If you wanted to get a ketone, you could just use a secondary alcohol. If you wanted to get a carboxylic acid, you could do a Jones oxidation on a primary alcohol or an aldehyde. This would give you a carboxylic acid. Alternatively, you could treat an aldehyde with sodium chloride under weakly acidic conditions. This should actually say NaH2PO4, and this will afford a carboxylic acid. Alternatively, you could do the oxidative cleavage of an alkene to get ketones or aldehydes, as shown here with ozonolysis or the Lemieux-Johnson oxidation where first we have the dihydroxylation and subsequent pyridate cleavage to afford aldehydes or ketones. If you treat an alkyne and you want to make it into a carboxylic acid, you can treat it with uh, potassium permanganate or you could do ozonolysis, and this will also form carboxylic acids. Now it's also worth noting that in the previous slide, I'm just going to go back quickly here, you could see that uh, two slides ago, this is also a way to make carboxylic acids, but because we already have a carboxylate here, it isn't very productive. Okay, now back forward. If we wanted to make ketones, aside from the method that we just discussed, using oxidative cleavage of alkenes, you could add a cuprate to an acyl halide. Additionally, you could add a Grignard reagent to a Weinreb amide, which, if you'll recall, this is stable at low temperatures and upon hydrolysis affords the ketones. This is one way to get around over-addition. Now, one way to make amines that we briefly discussed is to take something like an alkyl halide, treat it with a thalamide, and then undergo deprotection, this will afford a primary amine. Now, another method that we talked about was the alkylation of existing amines. However, the reason you don't want to do this is this will keep alkylating, and it's a terrible approach. One method I didn't list here that you could still do is the treatment of a nitrile with uh, lithium aluminum hydride, which, if you want to see, go to the reduction video where we talk about lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride, and that's discussed there. So that would be one other option to access primary amines that we've discussed so far. Now, one way to make ethers would be the treatment of a phenol, or a phenoxide more specifically, with an alkylating agent. Here's one example of that, where we make an aryl alkyl ether. This works well for phenols, but if you recall for alcohols, this just generally doesn't work that well, because whatever your alkylating agent is can often eliminate, and you have to use a much stronger base to deprotonate the alcohol. Alkoxides are good bases, they're not good nucleophiles, but you can occasionally do this for some special systems. So here's one example of that. Now, if we want to make epoxides using the methods that we've talked about so far, in lecture 26, we talked about using peracids to epoxidize alkenes. Alternatively, you could use uh, so hydrogen peroxide or sodium hypochlorite uh, to an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl or some other sort of Michael acceptor. This would also work. Now, if we wanted to make an alkyl halide, the only way that we've talked about doing that so far is the treatment of an alcohol with either thionyl chloride or the use of the Appel reaction to make uh, to make an alkyl halide such as bromide, iodide, or chloride. This doesn't work for fluoride. If you want to do fluoride, you have to use something like DAST or deoxyfluor, as I briefly talked about in the intro of one of the earlier videos. Now, the other thing you could do that we didn't talk about too much explicitly is SN1 with some sort of acid like HCl, HBr, or HI. But the reason that I don't discuss this here is this isn't a very good approach most of the time. There are cases where this works, but these reactions are much more reliable. Now, if you want to make phosphorus or sulfur derivatives, I would encourage you to go and look at lecture uh, 9 and 10, where we talk about those. Those are really straightforward, and they're not worth discussing at length here. Now, let's go through the exam question rules. So, if you want to answer these questions, there's several things you're allowed to use. First, you can use any elemental metal. So, this would include lithium, magnesium, copper. Um, you could also use any other inorganic reagent, so you could use thionyl chloride, you could use copper 1 iodide, that would be acceptable. You're allowed to use triphenylphosphine, tetrahalomethane, such as uh, carbon tetraiodide, carbon tetrabromide. You can use sodium sulfonate salts, thiourea, coupling reagents such as pi bop or hatu. 
You can also use bases as long as you're only using them as a base. So you can use Nbuli as a base, but you can't use it for CC bond forming reactions, for instance. Now, you can use solvents, but only if you're using them as solvents. Now, I'm not too picky here. I would only encourage you to write a solvent if it really matters for the reaction. But if you want practice predicting what type of solvents are used for what type of reactions, that's okay too. So you're welcome to use solvents. You're allowed to use protecting groups or enolate traps if you have to trap an enolate at any point. Um, and you're allowed to use catalysts such as proline or secondary amines if you're using them as catalysts or reagents. Okay, so in this first problem, I'll hang on each problem for at least 20 seconds or so, so you can get a good look at it. Pause the video right now if you want to work on it. Starting with this benzyl alcohol on the left, prepare this phenol. And you can use a multi-step synthesis. All of the exam questions are multi-step synthesis questions, as this whole lecture is kind of bringing everything that we've learned so far together, so that you can actually apply it to solve real organic chemistry problems. Now in this next problem, you have two different starting materials, bromobenzene and acetone. And the product that you have to make of this reaction is alpha methyl styrene oxide. There's several ways you could do these reactions. I just want to see an efficient route that would work fairly well. Not necessarily one that's published, but one that would work well on paper at least. Now in the next problem, we have meldrum's acid and we're treating it with benzyl alcohol under some sort of conditions. The other thing I want to highlight is you don't necessarily have to use both starting materials at each step. You just have to use them at some point in the synthesis to get the final product. So you might not need both of these right away, you might have to modify them first. In the next problem, we have cyclohexanone and 1,3-propanediol, and from that we have to form this, this thioether. This might be a bit challenging, but if you go back and watch the videos where we discuss some of the different chemistry to uh, make alkenes and make thioethers, this should be relatively straightforward. In the next problem, we have this aldehyde, this benzylic chloride, and this styrene derivative, and we convert this to a benzylic alcohol, another benzylic alcohol, and the chloride disappears. And so this might be a little bit more challenging, or this might be really easy, depending on which lectures you've paid attention to. Now, the final problem for this exam is probably the most challenging, and we start with this keto aldehyde. We treat it with... Uh, some sort of reagent derived from methyl bromide, as well as something derived from ethanol, and somehow we have to get to this cyclic uh, keto alcohol on the right. And this one might be the hardest to solve, but in the next lecture we're going to work through every single one of these as the main topic. And so hopefully these exam questions have been fairly fair. Uh, they test the concepts we've talked about so far. Obviously this is mostly for entertainment as well as practice, so don't take it too seriously. And if you have to go back and watch videos to work on the problems, that's all right. And you might come up with a different solution than I do in the next video, and that's fine. There's many ways to solve problems in organic chemistry, and that's one of the things that makes it so great. So I hope this has been a useful reaction recap video, and I hope that the exam questions have helped challenge your organic chemistry knowledge. I hope you have a fun time trying to solve them, and we'll go through them in the next video. Have a great day.